Hey everyone, it's Jessica from Stitch House. I'm trying something new. I hope you like these videos. Um, I'm not sure where they're going yet, but the whole point is to have fun and talk to cool people. And uh, that's what I plan on doing. So if you like this video uh, or you find something really interesting in it that you think you could share with somebody else, I hope you do. And uh, look forward to creating more things in the future. Thanks for watching. Jessica, I... Um... I feel like we have very similar kind of upbringings, right? Like I grew up in a family that, you know, was involved in embroidery professionally, right? My father bought an embroidery machine in 1979. And I always um, remember when it showed up at our house because it, it was in this ginormous wooden crate, you know? <laughs> and I saw one of those crates. You guys sometimes have crates like that at your store, right? I've seen yeah. so that wooden crate. My mom and I nicknamed that machine Taz because we just thought the Tasmanian devil was going to come breaking out of that box. <laughs> and so that is really like 1979. I was still just a kid going to school and my dad started this embroidery company. And literally one of my very first jobs was like trimming the threads between the letters. Because back in those days, you know, in the 1980s, just to, you know, kind of rewind, in the 1980s, there was no such thing as closest join letters. So you had to trim between every letter. It was all bottom join. Um, and so it was a lot of snipping and then folding and putting the jackets in the boxes and ship them off. And then, you know, maybe a few days later, dad gets this call and it's like, there's some problems with the job. And apparently <laughs> I may have snipped a few holes in some of those jackets and just figured, who's going to notice? Oh, wow. And I fold them up and ship them off. And so my dad had to look like the, um, you know, the bad guy. And he, so he did made it right and made new jackets. But so I kept one of those jackets just so you know, I still own one of those jackets because I figured really? I was like literally my roots in embroidery. Um, and if I didn't work for my dad, I would have never lasted in the embroidery industry because it was like my part-time job going through school, right? You know, my parents, if you wanted things, you, you know, if you needed a new sun ice ski jacket you know i don't know if you guys had those down in florida but no. up in canada sun ice was like the thing right you needed a cool winter coat to look good when you went to school anyway so i had a part-time job and i honestly jessica i never planned any of this like i it just happened organically i would have bet a million dollars coming out of high school that i was never going to be a teacher or an author and yet here I am and I, I share my, I travel to, to share my knowledge all the time. I'm certainly not a teacher. I mean, my wife's yes, a teacher, are. but I, I, and I love teachers, but I just didn't become educated to be a teacher. I became educated in home embroidery in the school of hard knocks, right? I just went to work and I learned, well, I spent 25 years in my family business creating logos and, and punching tapes, right? Cause this is an embroidery design from the 1980s, Jessica. So it tells you on here like what format it is and how many stitches this design is. It's probably backwards to you. And then there's like a, literally a bunch of holes in here. And this tape would load on my embroidery machine at the front of it. It had a reel-to-reel -reel on the front of the machine and you would put the tape on there and the holes told the machine how to move the hoop, right? And back in those days, I used to know how to read these holes because if you made a mistake, and trust me, I made mistakes. I was a teenager, I was a young guy. I, you had to repunch that part of the design and then fish through the tape and cut it. We had a little sort of splicing unit that we could put the tapes together and that was design editing. So wow. I often joke when people, you know, nowadays I have the dream job. I'm a software manager for R&K Distributing. I get to influence, you know, not only what we do next, but just, I love embroidery software. I always did. Um, that was always my thing that got me excited, the computers and the computerization of the industry. And I was kind of laughing because when I, back in those days, it was all about, you know, how much and how fast, you know, when could we get it? And one of the, it sounds funny, but one of the big things that came in the industry was the fax machine. Like literally that thing that nobody even owns anymore, right? Who owns a fax anymore? The bank might have a fax. The bank says, can I send you a fax? I'm like, you want to send Synchrony a fax? Synchrony Bank asks for faxes, by right, the way. The bank. <laughs> My bank said that to me and I said, do I need a new bank? Like, yeah. what do you mean you want me to send you a fax? <laughs> Come on. There's an app for what, that. There's what decade that. are we in, you guys? It's 23. <laughs> so show me, the, uh, show me the tool that you use to do the punching. Yeah. This is a... Uh, four button cursor. 
it has a crosshair in the center. I don't know if you can see that very well. And yeah. so I would have had a big digi board that probably would be about 36 by 48. Like it was literally, I could barely get my hands on either side of it. And it was about this tall. And so we would make a, a drawing. We would make a draft. So I would start with a photograph. That's Saskatoon, by the way. Probably what it looks like today. There's still snow. We still have snow here, if you can imagine. A lot I, I of it. can imagine. A lot of yeah. it. Um, and that's the embroidery design that I made from wow. the photograph. So to make that, you know, maybe you thought, oh, I used the Floriani sketch -a stitch to make that. No, I made this in the 1980s, okay, long before. And so this is the draft that I used to punch that. So I don't know how well this will show up on my camera, but can you see any of the lines in there? And all my oh, little yeah. stitch, like I literally had to draw. You almost drew all the stitches onto the draft. And then wow. you would belly up to that board. I, I like, not all, some digitizers like the board horizontal, but I always made it vertical so that I could keep my back straight. So you had a lot of like up and down with your shoulders and beep, 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 beep. And then that tape would come spitting out of the paper tape punch unit. So in 1984, my dad bought our first digitizing software, okay, to punch tapes. Um, in the early 1980s, my father became a rep. So he was very good with his embroidery company. And we were, you know, pretty much the only one around for a long, 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 long way. And so he became a sales agent for um, Baird and embroidery machines. So Baird is like one of your commercial sort of, you know, um, industrial type machines. And yeah. he sold those for at least 10 or eight years, maybe, or something like that. And every time my dad sold another machine, I got a new customer. And that's really how I became a puncher. And I, I never even, it wasn't even a plan. It was just my part-time job in high school, rolled into my full-time job after high school. Um, but there was that one little gap year when uh, my girlfriend wanted to go to school in George Brown College in Toronto. She was going to go to the graphic design course and um, I moved there with her. So I got a job working for the company that my dad was a sales agent for. I went to work for McPherson. So um, I started digitizing in 1984 and in 1987, I moved to Toronto. I only lived there for about a year. And when my girlfriend and I broke up, I moved back to Saskatchewan <laughs> and came back to my family business and went right back and, you know, bought a little house and then just never looked back kind of thing. And I, I think I spent 25 years doing about a hundred thousand embroidery designs. Uh, my dad's company is called Stitchitize. And um, we were stitchitized because we digitized stitches, right? So we made it stitchitized. And that, so he, um, I grew up, you know, working at stitchitized and, and then really it was home embroidery hadn't even been invented yet. Like it literally wasn't a thing. It didn't, I think it was the early 1990s when the very first kind of machine started to show up. You might yeah. remember that. Like how old would you have been in the early Like 90s? the Janome, I have a picture 8, next 000. to the Janome memory, the, the 9,000. I have which one. I think had a little bit bigger screen. Yeah. Yeah. I know I, think, I still uh, have one. Oh, you would really? In the box, like brand new in the box. It never, I don't know why, don't ask me why, but I still have a 9,000 brand new in the box. <laughs> I, uh, I have a picture next to my, next to it in my kindergarten yearbook, Trevor. <laughs> That's awesome. In your kindergarten. Um... Well, so that, that machine, I saw it. I didn't buy it new, by the way. Um, but I still, I kind of discounted it, a home embroidery at first. And so I didn't pay much attention to home embroidery and it was really the internet that made me realize it, right? Because we did make stock designs, but we didn't make them for home embroiderers. We made them for our commercial cups customers. I did a lot of flags and a lot of, remember my Canada jacket, like all that yeah. stuff was like from with all those beautiful kind of crests and things. Those were made um, out of spare time because the, the people, it wasn't just me. The 100,000 designs, it wasn't just me. It was a team, right? I, I mentored uh, about a dozen people that were either the draftsmen that did the drawings or the digitizers, the punchers. We were usually sort of three punchers and three draftsmen, a proofer, somebody to ship, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then the production department would have had all, my dad had an, an embroidery, you know, we had 40 heads. So that wasn't a massive embroidery company, but that was pretty big. And for Western Canada, that was certainly big, right? To have a big company like that. Um, in Saskatoon, we were certainly the big embroidery shop around and, um, yeah, so really out of that, I, it was the year 2000, 
one of my customers who knew me invited me to Calgary, Alberta to teach a class. And I was like, oh, I've never thought of such a thing, but um, I wanted to sell stock designs, right? We had just started figuring out, like in the late 1990s, stock designs were like finding gold. Everybody was looking for them. They were collecting them. And the, and the machine companies were selling them for like really big bucks, right? Like a, to buy those little proprietary cards that were, yep. you know, they, they really knew that their customers were like a captive market. So the design sets were expensive. And once somebody made that little amazing box. Oh, I remember it. Remember that thing? That yep. amazing box allowed you to connect your computer and write cards that could stick in those machines. And that was just like a game changer. And that was when I found out about it. I was like, oh my God, who are all these people that are looking for embroidery designs? And they're nuts. Like I'd never seen people behave such a way. They were just feverishly looking and asking. Mm -hmm. And and I made a little website and I had like some embroidered, some Christmas collections on it. It was the 1999, my 1999 Christmas collection. And I, my email lit up like I'd never experienced such a thing. Like I honestly thought we'd won the lottery. Like it was just like, what is going on? And it opened my eyes wide open. So in the year 2000, I went to Calgary and I taught a class and um, I loved it. I was like, they couldn't get me to stop talking. I just had so much <laughs> I wanted to share, all the things that I learned. And there was all these people that also digitized, you know, because by that time you could buy home, you know, the year 2000, you could get literally digitizing software for under $2,000, which was unheard Origins. of. Unheard I think it was of. like origin software, I had, right? I had Janome. The, they oh, had that yeah. little sketch. There was all kinds of, it got better and that better and better, right? You would drag along. Do you remember? You would yes. drag it along this really goofy slow. scanning. Yeah. Some pro or something, right? Um, you know, my mom always planned my birthday parties around what she could embroider. And I had a Susie oh. Zoo birthday party. Do you oh, remember cool. that yeah. that uh, card that would go in? It was very popular. But <sighs> those cards were like, I think like a hundred bucks oh, around more. there, 150. Yep. Yeah. And you'd get what, six designs, maybe 10, maybe 12 10. designs. Yeah. 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 For 150 bucks. Now, and, and I remember back when I used to demonstrate embroidery machines, when I was working at my mom's store, the number one thing people would want to do when they would sit down at an embroidery machine and say, well, can I see what the built-in designs are? Because they wanted to know what they were getting, what fonts they were getting, right. what, what, um, you know, what the Disney character was, if they were buying a brother machine or whatever that has changed completely. Uh, since we have access to the internet and software and all that kind of stuff. So one of the things I kind of would love for you to talk about, Trevor, is mm -hmm. um, like myth bust for me, the fact that a lot of people that are embroidering think that they don't need digitizing software. And I always tell them that that's a lie. At any, if you own an expensive embroidery machine and it, even if you're doing it for hobby, like there's a use for digitizing software. They told me they were going to make it automated and I laughed right in their faces. Like I'm talking about the owners of the software developers, not in their faces, but I said, yeah, right. But they did it and it's amazing. And I'm not saying that I'm not smarter than a computer because I am, I, to this day, I can still beat the auto digitizer. Um, but it's pretty amazing, right? That I can take the Ford logo and like scan it in and tell it to make embroidery. And it, it's like that kind of a, graphical image can be instantly converted into thread. It's the flowers and the stuff where I think there's still more need for sort of that human eye that just try and give a little white poodle, right? Like your mom's dog. What's your mom's dog's name? Summer. Summer, of course. Summer. <laughs> try and give a picture of summer to the auto digitizer and it's the hardest job because all it sees is white. It's, you know, it's and it doesn't know that it's a dog, you know, it just sees an image that to the, to the computer, it's their pixels, right? They're just little dots of colors and it doesn't know that that's a border and that's a nose and that's an eye. So we can pick those details out and make them easier. And if you don't own software, you're limited to what you can do with the designs that you buy. Very limited. Mm -hmm. And with software, I can resize them, I can combine them, I can repurpose them, I can take the bird off of a branch and put it on a birdhouse. I can make them my own and, and do what I want, you know, and I think that's really why most people get software. Um, and I think it's sort of like an integral part, like really, you shouldn't buy an embroidery machine and not get some software. So when I'm there, if anybody wants to talk software, I'm all for that, because that's 
you know, but really my passion is sharing knowledge and I love to share how I create. And so really when I come out, a lot of times people come with very good questions. They, they kind of know I'm coming. And so they, they, maybe they take some pictures of some things that they've been working on and then they can come and get like an eyes that have literally seen a hundred thousand logos be created can help with I used to joke and say, I can drive down the street and go, Oh, the Wendy's logo, that's 10,000 stitches. Like, you know, I wow. could just quote, I, I would, because that was the thing that I did the most was quoting. People wanted to know back in those days, they wanted to know how much it was. It was a pretty big variable. We used to charge in the 1980s, $25 per thousand stitches. So your okay. 10,000 stitch design cost $250 to get it digitized or punched as we call it. And, um, plus maybe an art charge, you know, and I, I've done big back crests that have, I've charged, you know, well over a thousand dollars to do the work on, you know, nowadays you can probably find somebody to do it for cheaper. <laughs> now I'll be honest, you know, I mean, you know, let's face it. Some of that work's gone off overseas because it's the internet and you can just get somebody to work on it and where labor's a little cheaper or a lot cheaper. And it doesn't mean they're not good. So you can buy embroidery designs, but one way or another, whether you're buying them or making them yourself, you need software to be able to edit. I think that's true. Totally. totally true. I, I, I always try to like explain to people, um, you know, they'll say, why do I need software? I say, well, okay, think about if someone emailed you an Excel file or a Microsoft Word file and you didn't have Excel or Microsoft Word on your computer. It's the same thing when you buy an embroidery design, right? Like yeah. you can buy an embroidery design online, but the only thing that you can do without software is just save it to your USB stick um, or you know SD card or however you're transferring that design file to your machine. But most people don't wanna do that. They want to open up a design. They say, maybe I don't want these, uh, you know, these flowers to be red. I want them to be yellow. Uh, maybe I wanna add some words down here. Maybe I wanna arc it. Maybe I wanna take away an entire design file on here. And so you can't do that unless you have some sort of software. And the way the world is, everything is customized now. Nothing, nobody wants the standard thing that everybody else has. The other thing I really love about the um, FPCU software, which is what I call the lifelong journey of learning to embroider, is that based on the design that you put in, in the file, FPCU will create a, and what you're going to embroider it on, it will give you the formula for how to stabilize it as well. Yes. And I that's know. invaluable. So those are actually the Floriani family recipes. Like Walter Floriani, that's the person that our company's like named after. And Walter, he's just like me and you. He grew up in this industry and his family did it for five gener. He was the fifth generation wow. of Floriani's to do embroidery, you know, professionally. And they worked in Europe, like on Shifley looms. And when they came to America, um, they were very involved with industry. And Walter was kind of the young guy of the family that f he was the first person I ever heard of that was teaching what he'd learned. Because wow. in the 1980s, everybody kept their cards close to their chest like poker you know if you learned something you weren't sharing it you with everyone sharing. you were not sharing you were that was proprietary you were your company and literally that's why we started making stock designs i think i tried to start that story and didn't finish because i didn't want to have to lay off those people that I, they were my family right the dozen people they were very personal you know we worked together and they were very knowledgeable and i knew that if i ever laid them off that the embroidery shop down the street would hire them in a heartbeat so when times got slow we made stock designs so they didn't just do nothing and it's ironic but we didn't ever make stock designs like flowers or butterflies we did a lot of logging trucks and you know those kind of things that we yeah. our, thought our customers would like and once i kind of came face to face with this whole new embroiderer and the you know, early 2000s, we totally changed our embroidery. Uh, we, we actually geared up to make stock designs and, um, you know, hired artists to create illustrations with purpose and not just, you know, and it was uh, such an exciting time. Um, I, I loved that I got to work with my mom and my dad every day and see them and really uh, my brother, my sister, we all worked together at the same time. Um, and so it's kind of fun to share my story. Thanks for asking a bit of that. Um, 
um, did I tell you the story about Walter when I met him? Because I no, it was 1989, and my dad and I were going to the Imprinted Sports Square show in Calgary, Alberta. Okay, so the CISS show. And that's where you went to get the latest Fruit of the Loom catalogs and, you know, see the latest screen printing and embroidery equipment. And um, my dad was kind of teasing me and saying, hey, Trevor, there's a guy teaching a class. You know, this is, I believe it was 1989. So Walter was in Calgary and he was teaching, right? He was putting on a class and my dad suggested I take the class. And I kind of elbowed him like, what do you mean by that, dad, right? Like, I'm supposed to be the expert here, you know? But of course I took his class. Any expert would take another expert's class, right? Why wouldn't you? I'd never heard of Walter, but I loved him. Like, and instantly he's just like the kind of person that has this wonderful energy and you just want to know him and you want to know about him. And of course I joined his club, right? Because Walter had a club. It was called the Fun Club. It was the Floriani <laughs> United makes sense. Network for Embroidery Education. It was the Fun <laughs> Club. Jessica, this was probably 20 years before Facebook was invented, Flor Walter had his own Facebook just for embroidery. And it was the wow. fun, it was actually, a, a, yeah, it was a really cool thing. And so in the year 2004, I went to a fun club event in Las Vegas. Okay. And me and my <laughs> wife, Lorna, went to Vegas. Um, Walter had a cool, like it was his own sort of like, ballroom that he'd rented out and put on his own event and i went there to uh vend I, I i rented a table and i did really well i brought in i think i came in with a uh 2000 design collection you know like just wow. one disc buy it all kind because of, what was i going to do bring down hundreds of design sets i was like i i needed okay. something i could come with so anyway it was um it was really interesting to meet him and and i i, I never knew i would work for floriani or with walter but um, I always, every time I was at a show, like my dad and I traveled to lots of places to promote our embroidery. And if Walter was there, I would track him down and get pictures with him, you know? So I've got all these Walter pictures because that's who I am. And you'll know that because I have pictures with you from every time. Like, yes, I just like pictures. to take pictures. Yeah. So Walter, um, Walter passed away recently, but the company is still called Floriani. When did you meet Ricky? And um, what was your memory of like when Ricky decided to um, join forces? So, um, I was really proud for Walter. I saw him at a, I think it was like a Janome conference and the, he had his own booth with the uh, Floriani thread stabilizers software. I have pictures from that weekend with Walter. He looked a lot different. He was unbearded at the time. I think he just had a child and, um, it was great to catch up with him. I was so happy for him. He introduced me to Ricky and Kay Brooks, who are the R and the K of R and K distributing. And they're just the most wonderful people. And, um, you know, Jessica, I still didn't know I was going to work outside of my mom and dad's company, but as things changed and, you know, life went on, um, I decided to start my own company and I wanted to get into embroidery education. You know, in 2008, I... Like I started teaching in the year 2000, but then I started my own company and I, I just left mom and dad. And so they still have digitized and I certainly do lots to support them and help them. But, um, you know, in reality is there's no more digitizing. So we don't have new designs at Stitchitize, you know, it's a, but there's a beautiful collection there. But, but that said, um, now I'm a teacher and I'm teaching through the internet. And I was like way ahead of the zoom curve, right? Like I had my own <laughs> go-to meeting account and I was doing webinars and, and people were joining my classes and, um, now I feel like everybody's doing what I do because <laughs> that's what everybody well, does now. <laughs> but but not everybody has your background of knowledge, and that's what I was really hoping we could convey in this uh, in this video is that you bring a whole different uh, uh, perspective to this digitizing and embroidery teaching um, because you've seen it all the way through from the punch designs all the way to what it is now. And. I have to tell you, um, I was super honored when you asked if you I would interview. I was like, I love what you are doing with your um, series. You. And so I didn't actually imagine that you would approach me, but I'm thrilled that you did. And I thank you for the opportunity to tell. I mean, so it was 2015, if you want me to finish the story, when I finally yeah. arrived at Floriani, right? I had been doing embroidery for a long time, but in 2015, some of my students were saying to me, we wish you would do classes for the Floriani software. Um, all the girls are switching to it and we think you would be awesome for it. 
And so I was like, that's all I had to hear. I called, I just picked up my phone and I called Ricky and I was like, Hey Ricky, I'm interested in doing some training for your software. And he was so excited when I called him. Like, <laughs> I can't even express the call. I just didn't expect that reaction, but he was really happy to have me and, and bring me into the team with Walter and with DJ and, and, and allow me to do my workshop, you know? And I said, but Ricky, I don't want to travel. I had babies in my house and I didn't want to be gone from 2000 to 2015. Those were the best years to be at home. And so I never regret any of that. I know other guys that were doing what I did, went on to do a lot of great events, you know, John, Steve, lots of people did really amazing things. And I stayed home and, and did different things, but I was, you know, but now it's my turn to be out there, you know, and, and I'm happy to do Let's it. Let's do it. I'm, I don't, I still come home, you know, every week and see my family, but I go for three, four days. So I'm, I'm happy to come to people's store. And I mean, you have the most beautiful store I've ever been to is just so you know, it's gorgeous. <laughs> and you. the energy inside there, like, I know it's like a social club, you know, it's that everybody snows each other or if they don't, they're getting to know people the moment they walk totally. in the door. Right. It's like, yeah. you want to be there and you want to get your machine there because you know that you're going to feel awkward if you're coming to all these things and you didn't buy anything there. Right. It's like, you, so it's the only place as far as I'm concerned, if you live anywhere near uh, Dallas or Plano, Texas, I mean, why would you show up anywhere? I mean, even if you don't live in that area, it's the most amazing destination. Like if you guys Thank are you. watching this and you're in, you know, like somewhere else, like up here in Canada and you're like, where should we go? <laughs> Check out Jessica's sewing store. Like literally <laughs> come on down next time Jessica has me, it's going to be in May. And um, so just book your tickets. They, you know, you can get there from Saskatoon. It's just a couple of plane rides. It's not that far I, to go. I did not pay Trevor to say any of this, you guys. <laughs> no, I heard um, store is the best. I, I like, I'm not saying the best because there's, I go to a lot of amazing stores. And so, you know, Veronica is going to watch this and be like, Trevor. <laughs> okay. Your mom has, you and your mom are very similar in like a lot of ways. And um, I love both of your stores uh, because of how uh, clear it is to me what we're doing there and um the way that you present it is just like top notch and then it's the atmosphere your mom does the same thing she's got this amazing yeah. community that comes in i i got gifts that i come back the second time the students were bringing me shirts that they embroidered for me at authorized like and so those are you know that's my favorite part of what i do jessica is the connections that you make with the people I've made some really amazing connections over the years and even just the small information exchange that happens between the people that you only meet once or twice in your life. But um, I just love the energy that people bring to the events and, and I'm learning too, right? You can't know it all. You'll never do that. And so if you're, if you want to stay young, then you try and keep learning, right? And keep it moving, you know, so I love to learn. That's one of my favorite things. So yeah. Anyway, so in 2015, that happened in 2019. Um, I became the software manager for RNK distributing. Yeah. And so now it's um, my role is to, I guess, you know, like, just work with the developers to plan the updates yeah. is mainly the next thing, right? And, and work with customers if they have questions or complaints or um, if they're not sure if it's working correctly, they'll often connect those people to me. And I want to say one more thing because I don't know how long you're going to keep me on, but um, <laughs> one of my favorite stories about a friend that I made from England who didn't buy, she didn't, she was a hand craftsperson. And it was okay. later in life that she got a little Janome machine, just like you and I, she had one of those. And it didn't have a very big hoop. And so it wasn't long before she, you know, had to get a bigger hoop and, you know, a little bit nicer machine. And when they did, they gave her digitizing software. Thank God they threw it in because she would have <laughs> never bought it. She would have never bought it. But she became one of the most creative digitizers I ever knew. And she was in her late 70s. Wow. When she got involved and she wow. was an octogenarian when Maggie passed away. Um, this is a true story. Maggie created embroidery designs until her dying days on earth. Um, wow. Long after she was well enough to get up and actually run her embroidery machine, she from bed still made stuff. She still communicated, right? You know how you know with the computer and the thing and she, yeah. would, she would send me designs and I'd be stitching them because she just did it, you know, and she was sick with cancer. And I just, you know, I went, I went through her cancer with her. It was, 
a great relationship we had and I miss her so much. Wow. But so the friendships that you make and I just the reason I wanted to tell my story about my good friend Maggie was because she, to me, she's so inspirational. I mean, I'm only 55, Jessica. I'm young. Maggie was 80 when she started doing what I was doing and no, you know, nothing wow. like 70 something. Like, I don't know. I don't actually know. People don't tell their true ages, but she was an octogenarian. What's your, what's your biggest piece of advice for someone mm -hmm. getting into machine embroidery, whether they're just doing it for a hobby? Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, I just recently downloaded TikTok Trevor and those kids are <laughs> sewing and embroidering like awesome. crazy, oh, like cool. crazy. Um, or, uh, for business, we just had a make money with embroidery event at Stitch House um, a few months ago, and we sold over like 16, 10 needles to people looking okay. to start at home embroidery businesses. I can give a lot of tips, but I think the thing is to decide what you want to do with your embroidery machine. Uh, you want to buy the right machine. Um, I, I, you know, um, a niche is a great way to do it, right? Maybe you're into dogs, maybe you're into horses. Uh, all those horse horses need horse blankets, you know, the, the, yeah. every race, everything. There's dogs. I mean, everybody wants dog personalization. But um, probably my biggest tip would be to try to find a product that you can sell your embroidery on and not just sell the embroidery. It's not yeah. wrong to be a contract embroiderer. I grew up as a contract embroiderer, right? My mom and dad's company never sold to the end user. We had other people that came in between us. And so maybe the manufacturer was the was selling, or maybe it was an ad specialty company that sold stuff and, you know, had a salesman, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm saying is contract embroidery, you only make money on the stitches. It's yeah. only money you make it. But if you sell a sweatshirt, you probably make more money on the sweatshirt than you do on your embroidery, the markup of the sweatshirt. So um, that would be my recommendation. And I know a lot of people Great love advice. hats. One more tip. I just think it's hard to make money making hats. I'm just, unless you're going to be serious and get serious equipment, hats is not my suggestion. Okay. Patches are very cool though. Patches. And they teach a great patch. Easy. Any machine can make a patch. I love patches. We did that awesome fun Friday patch day. Remember patches and postcards? So like much fun. Door. It was like patches. Yeah. Patch is a great way to do a little, you know, you don't have to make your living with your embroidery machine, but you could make a few bucks to justify buying a few more toys, right? Like it doesn't <laughs> have to be all about earning a living. That said, you could be at home and want to find a way to make money while staying home and embroidery could be a great way to do that um and it could grow and you could end up in your garage with a big you know setup you know with multiple machines and even help so for the home embroiderer i'm gonna say don't cheap out don't cheap out cheap thread on amazon is cheap thread on amazon don't cheap out like don't, don't cheap out no you yes. yeah we tried it all already uh, coffee <laughs> filters right plain news print, you know what i'm saying all that stuff and and i just there's a reason why floriani is very successful <laughs> and it's because the people who do a lot of embroidery understand that the challenges that they have are caused a lot of times by the products they choose and so spend totally. the money you know like i know our rolls are not the cheapest rolls you can buy but yep. they don't have potholes you know they're smooth it's a nice street to drive on and it, but when you come to Jessica's store, it's clear. She's got a beautiful wall of Floriani thread, right? There's 360 colors you can start collecting, right? They come in boxes. One of the things, Trevor, that drives me absolutely crazy when I hear people say this is they'll say, oh, you know, I, I just inherited someone's thread or in stabilizer collection, I'm like, throw it away. Like if it's been sitting there for years and 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, like, no because all you're going to do is frustrate yourself, right? You'll put that thread on a machine and maybe it starts th shredding or, or something like that. It's like, it's, it's not worth the six or $7 it is for a nice spool of thread to have a great successful, you know, full stitch out without having to stop and, you know, change the thread or, or rethread the machine every single time. And I say the same thing with stabilizer. It's, it, when you get puckers and, and you wonder why and you've bought a $10 roll on Amazon and it's not working, well, 
there's a reason, there's a big difference in the type of stabilizer you choose and the type of thread mm -hmm. you choose. And ask me how I know, because I've been watching people do this my whole life. Same with you. So you teach it on YouTube, like all the time I watch <laughs> you with your embroidery machines. Like I really love your segments because I don't have access to the same amount of equipment as you do, right? You always have the latest top of the line of everything. I mean, I've got some nice toys around here, but it's tough to maintain them all at that top yeah. level, right? I got to buy them all. So, um, I keep them as up to date as I can, but I love watching your videos because that's when I'm like, oh, I don't have that machine yet. Maybe that's my next machine, right? I better watch this. What's Jessica going to show us now? Well, I'm excited. I hope this video uh, reaches a bunch of people and I hope that they find you in one of the places that you're traveling to to teach, particularly Stitch House, because um, I want everybody yeah. to come there. But I, I, I want, I'm glad people get to know a little bit more about you and your background so that they know that when they're coming to an event with Trevor, that you have a lot of background knowledge on um, embroidery and you can, if you don't know an answer, you have great resources, you can find them, but I can't imagine you wouldn't know an answer. <laughs> you know so much about it. I don't embroidery. make it up though. I, I, if I don't know, then I just say, I don't know. Let's yeah. figure it out, you know? <laughs> I love a, a puzzle though, right? I, nothing makes me more challenged than when somebody's like, why did it do this? I don't know, let's yeah. figure that out, right? That's why I said I got my dream job really when RNK hired me to be the software manager. So um, I um, I love that I still, you know, our, DJ was the sort of first software manager and he's still wow. part of our team. Um, but um, we kind of almost switched roles in a way because, um, yeah. uh, not that we switched roles, but I'm just saying it's great that we work all together like that. So it's a really fun yeah, company to work DJ with. Yeah, we just DJ at the store and he's super cool too. You guys are great, I agree. a great team. I you agree. guys are great. <laughs> I, I agree. He's pretty amazing. Um, so, well, I, in fact, I think all of the Floriani National Educators are super talented individuals. Like when we get together, which isn't very often that I get to see them all, but usually a couple times a year, like when we're at the big VDTA show in Vegas, well, you know, many of us will be together, but we do our educators trainings. And um, I'm just so inspired by all of them, the things that they make. Yeah. And, um, the thing I think it's cool about it is like, so let's just say you bought Floriani products, stabilizers, thread, whatever, software, and now there's somebody coming to town and you've never met them. It's like a whole nother way to Every find time. out why did I buy that stuff, right? What? Because we'll yep. all show you something unique that you can do with it. And it's like every Floriani presentation is different. And that's really, I love that about our Me events. Too. I wish I could yeah. go to more of them, you know, like literally just sit there and, and attend them all. Cause I, so I hope all your people appreciate that. I know when I come down there that I'll see some of the people that I've seen before, but I really look forward to meeting new people, Jessica. Um, I'm, I love it. I want I'm people to know to that here. they don't have to be, they don't even have to know about Floriani to come to the events. Right. So, yep. yeah. I think this is really cool. I I'm, I'm loving learning more about people uh, right now, Trevor, like it, it's reinvigorating some of my um, passion for the industry. I, I forget, honestly, uh, that I know so many cool people because I, I grew up doing this. So I've got a, a lifeline to all you guys. <laughs> so, um, it's, it's been really cool to interview people. Um, and I, I don't know where this series is going, like I say at the end of every video, but, but I do think that it could be a nice catalog of of some of the most interesting people, I think, in the sewing and embroidery industry, mm -hmm. um, from quilting all the way to all the way to um, all the way to you know digitizers and fabric makers and all that kind of stuff. So, so like I said, I don't know where it's going, but um, I think people like knowing about other people and hearing their story and and just listening to uh, how people got to where they are today. And I think you did a really good job with that. Thanks, Jessica. Bye. Bye. Bye.